What does the Bible have to say about current world events and what the future looks like when we go forward from here? The answer is next on The Prophetic Connection. Of the hundreds of prophecies in the Bible, it's estimated that more than 90% have already been fulfilled, many of them by Jesus himself. For example, the nature of his birth, the place of his birth, uh, the, the nature of his ministry, accurate descriptions of how he would die, and yet he would be raised from death. These have all been fulfilled. On the other side of the prophetic equation, the dispersion of Israel among the nations. In fact, that occurred in fulfillment of something Jesus said, that the temple would be torn down and not even one stone would be left standing upon another. He said that about 40 years or so before it actually happened. And lo and behold, the Romans came. Uh, well, they were the occupying force in Israel anyway. But in AD 70, they utterly destroyed the temple, leaving not one stone upon the other on the Temple Mount and destroying Jerusalem and killing some 500,000 of its inhabitants. So then we had that great dispersion of Jews into all the nations. But then other prophecies were then fulfilled when Israel came back to the land, a sort of a trickle at the end of the um, 19th century uh, and then into the 20th century, hundreds upon hundreds of thousands, and now the numbers are in the millions. Those are prophecies that have also been fulfilled. But what of the other 10% of unfulfilled prophecies as I stand here today on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee? Um, I don't the camera probably can't see it, but for once I can see Mount Hermon in the north and I can see the streams of snow coming down the mountain. So the visibility is, is really quite good today. But about 10% of all prophecies still are to be fulfilled. And that's the subject of this new series of the prophetic connection. The question is, well, when will these 10% of prophecies be fulfilled? And what, what are the signals of the beginning of the end of the age that we hear so much about? No one knows the day or the hour. Jesus said that plainly, but he said something else, even as he said that. In Matthew 24, in verse 36, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as in the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So that then is our clue. If we can understand the days of Noah and why they parallel the times of the end, we'll be closer than ever to understanding when the remaining 10% of prophecies will be fulfilled. Since the beginning of civilization, Leaders and governments have at times used lies to keep power or control of their people. But why has lying become second nature to so many leaders today? Lying is so prevalent today because uh, I think that in the last 50 years, people have been raised with an ethic of the ends justifying the means. We talk about postmodernism, which is a foundation of modern deception, which teaches that there's really nothing ultimately right or wrong. So whatever you can do to gain ends that you would define as good, you can lie and disassemble and do whatever you want as long as you're moving the, the ball down the court. Now, the ethical standard for the world with regards to lying is it has to be lying for a good purpose. Of course, bad people lie for a bad purpose, but lying, you know, especially among our political leaders, is at an unprecedented level of acceptance. You know, there's a rising tide of deception in the world and leaders are caught in this tension between pleasing the people and telling the truth. And, um, you know, I, th I think in the postmodern world, the, the public has uh, lost much of its faith in truth. And most people, at least in Western societies, don't believe in an absolute truth. So they believe in 
facts and alternate facts and uh, you know there, there there's are no reality check going on and so so many leaders today they find the most expedient way is to just tell tell a lie and uh, defend it later if they have to could this trend toward lying be a result of increased demonic activity oh it's just an amazing level of demonic deception in the world today a lot more than hints I don't think we've ever raised a generation, especially in the Western world, that's supposed to be educated and to learn how to think. I don't think we've ever seen a generation that is so subject to propaganda. Under communism, you had the state controlling all media, whereas today you have not the state controlling the media, but media given over to, I would say, very leftist uh, perspectives on the world controls the narratives, controls the narratives of the Middle East, controls the narratives about um, uh, biblical faith and many, many other things. Jesus said that, that the end times would be characterized by deception. One of the first things he told his disciples when they asked him about the end times was he said, see to it that no one deceives you. And I believe there's going to be a increasing uh, onslaught of demonic deception in the end times. Definitely we're in that flow and uh, we're seeing an increase in the, the way people's minds work, uh, connecting to what is really true, being focused on an absolute God who, who runs a, a kingdom that will have no end. This is so foreign to uh, most of the secular world. What can Christians do to avoid being deceived? I think the greatest key to preventing deception is to be in God's Word every day. The Word of God reveals the living Word who is Jesus. And many of the deceptions of today are concerning Jesus, who He really is. And many deny His divinity, His deity. Many deny that He even came in the flesh. Or they deny that He said the things that He said. We have the Jesus Project and the Jesus Seminar. and denying that much of what Jesus said, he actually said. If we're in his word, we know who he is, then that will prevent much deception. The Bible warns that the days immediately preceding the second coming of Christ will be characterized by heightened demonic activity. These will be increasingly dangerous times when even those in places of leadership will be readily deceived. But this is precisely what happens when people reject the plumb line of God's truth and instead embrace diminished standards of morality. Stay tuned. After this short break, Dr. John Tweedy returns with his teaching. As we saw in the introduction to this episode, when we ask how close we are to the fulfillment of all remaining prophecies, something like 10% of all prophecy, we find a clue in something that Jesus said. Because he said, as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. That then raises the question, what was so distinctive about Noah's day? Now we know from Genesis chapter six that God was displeased with the generation of Noah's world because they become increasingly wicked and the thoughts of their hearts were only evil continually. On top of that, the world was full of violence. The word that's used in the Hebrew is Hamas. And today that word applies to a terrorist organization in Gaza, but Hamas means violence. The world of Noah's day was full of violence. And so our world is full of violence. But there's much more uh, than that. There are more parallels than simply the, the uh, world being full of violence. I really, I look to what the Apostle Paul wrote in two letters to Timothy, who was the young pastor that followed him as pastor of the church at Ephesus. It was a difficult posting. The ministry can be difficult at any time, but imagine trying to step into the footsteps of the great Apostle Paul, who had been there for three years, and now you're following after him. Anyway, Paul, it seems, found it necessary to send two letters to young Timothy to instruct him, to encourage him, but within the content of the letters, prophetic passages 
that could apply to Timothy's time, but Paul coaches them in phrases such as, um, in the latter days, meaning the end of the age, far into the future beyond Timothy's time. And let me look at the first one in 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, speaks expressly saying that in the latter times, that's why we know he's speaking of the distant future from where he was writing this nearly 2,000 years ago. In the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy. So lying will be commonplace according to what Paul is saying. Now, it's interesting Lying it seems to be come readily to the lips of some leaders today. You know, let me give you a couple of illustrations. If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Um, if you like your health plan, you can keep your health plan. Now, whether when those words were said, they were sincere, but certainly what happened afterwards, uh, that's not the reality. The words were simply not true uh, in their later context. And we had another leader who said, um, I never had sex with that woman. And I don't even need to tell you who said these things because you can readily identify with the figures behind the words. But those are just two individuals. And I mean, leaders all over the world seem to be lying constantly and deceiving the people. That's the point. This, this is an age, and not, and not necessarily leaders, people in general, can't seem to tell the truth. Part of the reason perhaps is they don't really know the truth that's found in Jesus of Nazareth. And look at this in verse two of, of this chapter, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, as if to say, um, they're not even conscious of the, that the fact that they're lying or even that they've been deceived or being hypocritical. And so in this episode, I want to deal um, with the age of lies and deception in particular. And then in the next episode, episode two, the age of apostasy, and that's just a word we use in church circles to mean a falling away from the true faith. So we have society in general uh, where lying is being practiced, and it seems through television because the new words we're hearing are fake news, which is suge suggests the media is making up stories that simply aren't true. So it's the spirit of the age, it's the character of the age that we're talking about when we say these things. Now, when we move into the second letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, we get a broad description of the last generation before Christ comes again. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now, Someone has counted 17 characteristics here. I'll leave that to you to check your Bible and, and see if there are that many, but no matter, here's, here's what Paul says. Speaking again about the future and the last generation it would seem. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. The Greek word is chilipas. It means hard, difficult. And certainly uh, we need only look at the television news to see how hard and difficult it has become for Christians and people of minority faiths all over the world. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers. There's not much that's redeeming about these, this description. Without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. So God has been, as, as it were, abandoned. And of course they have idols, they have things or people they worship, but they're not worshiping the almighty God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And that could be said of some quarters of the church. They have traditions, they seem to believe, but they're not functioning in the power of the Holy Spirit that is available to the church of Jesus Christ. And the church seems very anemic in some quarters, even as it's very strong uh, where it's being persecuted. And then it goes on from there, and from such people turn away. And Paul goes on to say other things here, but you can see from the letter that it, the description of this last generation is that it's, it's far removed from God. Now, in chapter, in the first letter, 
in chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy. Let me focus on deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, there are probably, most people today probably don't even believe in the existence of demons. Uh, unclean spirits, as the Bible also calls them, but these um, demonic spirit beings, creatures, that serve the kingdom of Satan. Now, I'm standing on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, in the shadow of the Golan Heights. And in biblical times, this was Gentile country, meaning um, it was ruled by Gentiles, not Jews. And so there were pigs that were kept. They grazed on these slopes. On that side, the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, that was under Jewish jurisdiction. So you would not have found pigs on the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. And one day, according to the story that's in Mark's gospel in chapter 5, Jesus crossed from somewhere over there to this side and somewhere along here, right where I'm standing. And the traditional side is just up the way here called Kersey. And as soon as he stepped out of the boat, he was confronted by a man who was possessed. And, and he talks to Jesus, but it's really the voices in the singular and the plural. And this man was in the tombs up in the hills, night and day, crying, and in fact, cutting himself with stones because and, and some kids are doing this today. They're cutting themselves with knives. It's the destructive force of evil influences, perhaps, that are on them. But certainly in the case of this man, that's what was happening. And so there's this encounter between him and Jesus. Now, I don't think he ever met Jesus before this moment. But the demons ex knew exactly who Jesus was. They recognized him. And there was an exchange. There, were, there, there was some, it was like words were exchanged between them. And then Jesus commands the demons to come out of this possessed man. But they plead with Jesus and they say, well, if you're going to send us out, I mean, they understood his authority. If you're going to send us out, at least send us into the swine. And on this slope, according to Mark chapter 5, these slopes, 2,000 pigs were grazing. And the spirits left the man and go into the pigs. And they ran headlong down into the sea. Now, the Sea of Galilee in biblical times uh, the water level was much higher than it is today. In fact, higher than the road that's just over my shoulder here. But you get the idea from the slopes behind me how easily it would have been for those swine to just storm down the hills and into the sea and be drowned. The story has a happy ending because later they find the man now wearing clothes because he was naked before. Now he's dressed and they find him in his right mind, which is to say, he has been delivered of demonic spirits. Now he pleads that he might go with Jesus and Jesus says, no, I, I don't want you to come with me. What I want you to do is go and explain in the Decapolis, Greek, Deca is the, the Greek word for 10. In the 10 Gentile cities from here, up in this area, I want you to go to those cities and you go and tell them what God has done for you. That's your mission from this point on. Now. Thinking of what Jesus said about Noah's day, thinking about what Paul wrote in those two letters, I want to speak about our times as we move through this new series, Amazing Prophecies Yet to be Fulfilled. And there are really three things I want to convey to you, the viewer. First of all, this is an age of deception and people will be deceived and they will be self-deceived. Um, lawless will abound. False prophets will be going around um, trying to deceive people. And even the love of many people, their commitment to Christ will grow cold because there'll also be difficult times and only those that can stay the course um, and survive the persecution will continue to walk with Christ. Second thing is that there'll be, uh, we've seen a major doctrinal shift in the last 50, 60 years, certainly from the 1960s. In other words, the seducing spirits, doctrines of demon, belief systems that are introduced by demons. And what's happening in our age, in fact, it's already happened, is that long-held beliefs of the Christian faith, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, that he was born of a virgin, that he could do miracles around this shoreline and in Jerusalem. Those doctrines of the church that 
stood the test of faith for 2,000 years, they have been knocked over by like nine pins in many churches where those beliefs are no longer believed. Uh, many don't believe we any lo longer live in an age of miracles. So that's the second thing we've seen. But the third thing that's very important from what Paul wrote is this, to understand that these things are the result, in part at least, of seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Remember what Jesus said about Satan. The thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And two more scriptures uh, to complete this teaching. In Hebrews 3, in verse 12, this is a warning. Whoever the writer of Hebrews was, I believe it was Paul, but uh, the author's not named. Here is a warning to us who find ourselves living in this kind of society. Verse 12 of Hebrews 3, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But encourage one another while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So that's one warning. And then another warning from the lips of the Apostle Peter in his second letter in verse 17 in chapter 3. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. As we move through this series, we're trying to unlock the prophecies that have not yet been fully fulfilled because our world is racing towards some grand conclusion. And the society, very much like the society of Noah's day, full of wickedness and violence, but even those influences can affect us as Christians unless we heed the warnings and hold tight to the faith that we once believed and have believed through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Don't go away. There's more from Dr. John Tweedy after this short break. When we think of Paul's description of the terminal generation, the generation of the last days, that is just before Christ comes, and it's an unflattering description, we said to ourselves, well, how could Paul possibly know? Well, I'm thinking of the reason for uh, prophecy in the first place, that God wants his servants to know what the future looks like. Now, we can't always understand it in absolute completeness and detail, but we can get glimpses that are important and milestones of history that tell us that prophecy is moving along exactly according to what God has said. I'm thinking of what something that is found in the book of Amos, Amos the prophet, and in chapter three in verse seven, he says this, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. That's what a prophet is. A prophet is someone who sees what others can't see. And the only reason he can see it is God reveals it to him. So the same is true for the apostles and certainly has to be true for the apostle Paul. And then the writer of the Hebrews who does not name himself, doesn't put his signature to the letter, he writes this in the very first verses of his letter to the Hebrews. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, meaning of the Father, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become so much better than the angel, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. 